Hello and welcome to this Australian BioCommons webinar. I'm Melissa Burke and I'm the Training and Communications Officer for Australian BioCommons and I'll also be your host for today. This webinar is part of a series where we share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools available to the life sciences community. Each month we hear from our national and international peers on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will help you achieve your best uh, medical, environmental and agricultural research. You can keep up to date with the latest Australian Biocommons news and events using the channels that you can see here on your screen. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case, I'm in Brisbane and this is the Turrbal and Yuggera people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Professor Mark Taylor to speak to us about protection of genomic data and the Australian Privacy Act. When is genomic data personal information? Mark is a professor in health law and regulation at the Melbourne Law School and the director of health law and emerging technologies at Helix at Melbourne. Mark's personal research interests focus on the regulation of personal, of personal information with emphasis on health information and genetic data. He is seeking to challenge the idea that privacy interests are incompatible with the public interest and his goal is to develop a concept of privacy that reconciles individual uh, interests with the public interest with the access, use and management of personal health information. Welcome to the webinar, Mark. I'm now going to hand over to you to get started with the presentation. Thanks very much, Melissa. And thank you to you and to Australian BioCommons for the invitation today. Uh, uh, can I start by acknowledging that I am living and working and speaking to you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Okay, so I was asked today if I would speak uh, about a paper that's a work in progress. We are drawing towards the close. Uh, we've pretty much worked out what we want to say, but it hasn't yet been submitted for publication. And if you have any thoughts about the paper, if you'd like to read it in draft form, or you have any thoughts about the argument, very receptive to discussing it outside of this particular webinar. Um, your contribution and thoughts would, I'm sure, help to finalise and polish the product. The paper uh, is to address the question of when is genomic data personal information? And we're considering that specifically within the context of Australian privacy law. The paper originated um, out of a, an Australian genomics funded project led by Professor Ainsley Newsom at the University of Sydney. Uh, but Ainsley reached out to myself and um, colleague, uh, PhD student of mine, Mina Peltiel here in Melbourne, um, to work on the project together and work on the paper together because you know that this was an area of interest of mine. The question, um, when is genomic data personal information, uh, is a question that has arisen not only within the context of this Australian genomics project, but it's a question which seems to crop up time and time again. In fact, I did another piece of work recently, uh, working with colleagues at the University of Tasmania, where we were asked to look at some of the issues that stakeholders recognised as pressing issues with regards to the regulation of genomic data in both the clinical and research context. Uh, we, we surveyed people, we got a whole range of issues. The paper has been written up and is available on the University of Tasmania website. The, the link to it is there, but you can also find it by just searching for University of Tasmania Centre of Law and Genomics, finding their occasional paper series. 
Um, within the broad range of issues that the stakeholders we interviewed identified as current issues um, impacting upon the, um, the regulation of effective regulation of genomic data in the clinical and research context was this question. So it, it's come up in more than one context, this question of whether genomic information is personal information under Australian privacy law. And it was recognised that genomic information, and this is a, a, an excerpt from the relevant chapter in this occasional paper, it was recognised genomic information will uh, typically only fall within the scope of privacy law if it meets the legislative definition of personal information. But it can be difficult for those who are processing genomic information on a day-to-day -day basis to confidently assess when it is personal information because it can be difficult to confidently assess when uh, the data is reasonably identifiable. And this is particularly the case as data moves between different collections with different permutations of possible future data linkage. Now, the significance of reasonable identifiability is something which I'll come back to and forms the central part of this presentation, really. But I just wanted to put the question, when is genomic information, personal information, in some kind of broader context and, and to share with you that it has arisen as a question of not merely academic interest, but real world practical significance uh, in more than one um, set, set, set of situations. So before we get into the presentation today, um, I just want to say something very briefly and high level about terminology, because if we're not using these words in the same way, if I'm not clear how I'm using them, then it's not going to make a lot of sense at all. So when I use the term genetic information, I am using the term to represent a legal category of information. Genetic information, those two words, genetic and information, those two words are the words which are used within the Privacy Act. The Privacy Act refers to genetic information. Genetic information is a subset of personal information. So the Australian Privacy Act, the, the key statutory protection of privacy for personal information in Australia at Commonwealth level refers to personal information and genetic information as a subset. Both of those terms have legal definitions and their understanding has to be informed by the principles and processes by which legal knowledge is constructed. There's a different methodology and a different epistemology for legal concepts to other kinds of concept, including scientific concept. So we can distinguish personal information and genetic information as concepts defined and given meaning, meaning through legal reason and technique from genomic data, which I'm going to use to represent the scientific concept or the concept of data or the type of data that you might regularly, if you're health pro practitioners, professionals, if you're health researchers, or if you um, just have an interest in these things, when you're talking about genomic data in, a, in either a scientific or a lay sense, um, that's what I, that's the label I'm going to apply to what you are talking about. So um, I'm going to try and be consistent in my use of the term genomic data to refer to that conceptual category of the, that, that type of data which you're referring to or a professional health professionals referring to when they talk about genomic data and recognize as a distinction in how we come to understand what falls within that category from a scientific perspective, a methodological, and as I say, epistemological distinction with regards to how we define what falls within that category when you're taking a scientific uh, approach um, to if you're taking a legal one. 
So really what we're trying to do simply is understand the extent to which those two concepts or conceptions of a concept, whether genomic data as understood scientifically has boundaries that are coterminous with the concept of genetic information as defined by law. Because it's very easy to assume that when we're talking about genomic data, that if we're talking about genomic data, then of course that's going to be genetic information uh, and regulated as genetic information by law. But one can't actually assume that just because it may be correct to describe it as genomic data scientifically, that it is also correct to describe it as genetic information legally. So we're going to explore the extent to which those two concepts are in fact perfectly overlapping, or indeed whether or not they may be overlapping, but not in a perfect way. So there will be times when stuff might be appropriately described as genomic data, but not regulated as genetic information by law. Uh, I hope that's clear. It's very difficult when I can't see you as to see whether or not I'm going too fast, too slow, or making any sense at all, but I'm going to press on. So when um, we, within the paper, we take uh, this approach to defining genomic data. Uh, we, we recognize that genomic data can sometimes be used uh, as a term to refer quite narrowly to data produced by genetic tests, such as predictive or carrier tests. Um, other times the term genomic data might be used more broadly to include things like family history, pedigree data, or other things of genomic content. Might even be used to extend to other kind of supporting clinical and administrative data if held um, together and, all, uh, and contributing towards the analysis and interpretation of the of the um, sequence data. But within the paper, we try to be clear that for our purposes, genomic data is going to include what, what might be described as raw or sequence read data, including whole genome and exome sequence, single nucleotide uh, variants, polymorphisms, and analyzed data, which is that sequence data with some form of analysis attached, which might identify particular differences between that sequence data and a reference genome, uh, may be written in variant call format, might include particular kinds of variant identifiers. It's, it's, it's not just sequence data, it's sequence data that's been through a, a stage of interpretation, has been analyzed, it's been, its significance has been described in some particular ways. It's, analyzed data but it's still genomic data we're, we're, we're saying within the paper um, and um, we recognize that, that analyzed data may itself be annotated, annotated and may be supported by other kinds of data which might help reveal the significance of particular kinds of variant and indeed is likely to be supported by other kinds of biographical or clinical data but we're not talking about that supporting data within the paper, we're only talking about um, the raw and the analyzed data within the paper. Okay, so that's what we mean when we are using the term genomic data. We're taking that kind of scientific, um, applying that scientific lens. Remembering that genetic information is we're understanding that from the legal perspective and genetic information itself is a subset of personal information, we have to start with a reflection on what we mean by personal information. Now, as I said, the, the, the key statutory protection uh, for privacy in Australia, at least at Commonwealth federal level, is the Privacy Act uh, 1988. And that contained within a definition of personal information. It states personal information means information or an opinion about an identified individual or an individual who is reasonably identifiable. That's whether the information is true or not and whether the information is recorded in a material form or not. 
focusing on the bold text, information about an identified individual or an individual who is reasonably identifiable, this has got two significant elements. The first is the word about. Information or opinion can only be personal information if it is about an identified individual or an identifiable individual. Now there's been um, some case law, uh, the Telstra case uh, investigating the, uh, the claims of um, Ben Grubb as to whether or not some of the mobile data held by Telstra was his personal information. The arguments hinged on whether or not that information was about him. So there's been some legal consideration of what the word about means and the word, the use of the word about itself is subject to some discussion at the moment as we are considering reform to the Privacy Act. There's some suggestion that the word about may be replaced by the term relate to. Now, if the term or the word about were re replaced by the term relate to, that would change the scope of the definition of personal information within Australian privacy law. It would probably extend it because the substitution is motivated by, by, in, by some at least, by uh, an, an intent to bring Australian privacy law closer into, into alignment with European data protection law. And whereas in Australia, the term about is used to um, ensure that personal information has an individual as a subject of the information. If an individual isn't a subject, they don't have to be the subject, but they do have to be a subject of the information. If they're not a subject of it, then the information isn't about them, at least but, um, that's one way of understanding the law. But if you were to substitute about with relate to, and you were to take the kind of approach which is taken within Europe when it comes to understanding what relate to means, then the European approach to interpretation of relate to is more extensive. It says, well, data can relate to a person if it has this content element, if it has this purpose element, or indeed if it has this effect. So it doesn't necessarily have to be about a person. It doesn't have to have them as the subject matter of it, or, or they don't, a person doesn't have to be the subject matter of the information. If the information is being used in a particular way, if the purpose of the collection or use processing of information is to inform decisions about an individual, then it might be a, it might relate to them in a relevant fashion for the purposes of um, the general data protection regulation, European privacy and data protection law. So this question about what does about mean and what would it mean if we changed the word about to relate to, what would that mean for the scope of personal information and what would that mean for genomic data and what genomic data would be captured within the scope of the Privacy Act definition of personal information. It's a really important question. But it's not one I'm going to say a lot more about now. We've really said quite a lot about it. Um, and until we know how the Privacy Act review uh, unpacks and where we end up landing, <clears throat> we won't be able to say anything any more definitive. And we are writing a separate paper about the word about and its potential significance for genomic data. But the paper that I'm talking to you about today is the paper where we focus on this other element of this definition. So as I've said, this definition of personal information has two key elements. The first is about. Per Personal information means information or opinion about an identified or identifiable individual. The other element is clearly the notion of identifiability itself. It will only be personal information if it's about an identified individual or an individual who is reasonably identifiable. So we're going to come back to that because that will be key because Genetic information 
genetic information, not genomic data, genetic information has to be personal information. If it's not personal information, it can't be genetic information because genetic information is a subcategory of personal information. And personal information has to be about, has to be about an identified or identifiable person. So if it's not, if the person isn't identified or reasonably identifiable, then it can't be genetic information. So uh, genetic information uh, it has its own definition. Remembering it's a subset of personal information, it has its own definition. Genetic information is defined within section six of the Privacy Act in, in the following ways. is defined as a type of health information. So genetic information about an individual in a form that is or could be predictive of the health of the individual or a genetic relative of the individual is health information uh, and is protected as sensitive information in the Privacy Act. The Privacy Act puts particular responsibilities upon those who are processing, uh, collecting, using, and disclosing personal information. It places additional responsibilities upon data custodians who are collecting, using, and disclosing sensitive information. So the, there are additional protections for this subcategory of information, and genetic information is one type of health information. But in order to be genetic information, according to section 6b, in order to be connect genetic information, uh, it has to be about an individual in the form that is or could be predictive of the health of the individual or a genetic relative of the individual. But one of the things that we have reflected on when writing this paper is the significance of terms being understood differently from different disciplinary perspectives. And it was pointed out to us that the term predictive genetic information might have a particular meaning uh, scientifically uh, from a perspective of a health professional, uh, predictive genetic information as, as a category, you might only refer to information that is predictive of the future health status of an individual who's currently asymptomatic. That's what I've been told, I'm not a health professional, this isn't my field, but so far as that's true, uh, I think there may be uh, a disconnect again here between the language as used by a health professional and or medical researcher and as used by a lawyer, because I see nothing within this definition to suggest that when they are referring to pre pre the predictive nature of this information that the individual uh, in question would need to be asymptomatic at the time. So it's important to recognize that these terms may have different meanings from different uh, disciplinary perspectives. But the significance of that particular distinction does fall away rather, given that the Privacy Act recognizes not only um, genetic information that is predictive of the health of an individual or genetic relative of the individual to be sensitive information. It also states that genetic information that is not health information will also be sensitive information. So genetic information occurs twice within the definition of sensitive information. It occurs once as a subset of health information and it occurs again as a category of sensitive information in its own right. So whether or not it is health information, genetic information is recognized to be sensitive information within the Privacy Act. But I say again, in order to be regulated as um, genetic information by the Privacy Act, in order to be regulated as sensitive information, it must first satisfy the definition of personal information. So it must as well as satisfying these definitions, it must also be about an identified individual or an individual who is reasonably identifiable. And it's 
that question to which I now turn. <clears throat> there has been some guidance issued by the courts and some regulatory guidance about what this means. What does it mean to say that an individual is identified or reasonably identifiable? There's not a lot in the case law about identifiability. But what does come through is the importance of context. And the, the notion of this being an evaluative conclusion, you have to take a series of things into consideration before you can reach a determination on this question. Even documents and records containing no obvious identifying features may nevertheless take on the quality of identifiability through the context in which they're held. In Telstra, uh, it was written that a determination of whether the identity can reasonably be ascertained will require this evaluative conclusion that I mentioned a moment ago. Here we have to look at both the nature and the quality of the data, but also the nature of the circumstances. Who has access to the data? What other information is available to them? What resources do they have? What would be required in order to uh, identify an individual? Uh, what kind of time and what kind of costs would that take? As I say, there's limited uh, case law, but there is some uh, regulatory guidance. The Office of the Australian Information Commissioner has said that um, the notion of whether or not an individual is reasonably identifiable is something which requires contextual consideration and within their guidance they've called out these features of the of the context as relevant not only the nature and the amount of information who will hold and have access to information but the other information that is available and the practicability of using that information to identify an individual okay so just before we try and apply this to genomic data i just want to reflect upon briefly the significance of this. It, it is really, really important and often overlooked in my experience that you cannot determine whether or not data is about an identified or identifiable individual by looking at the data alone. Invariably, you need to understand something about the context as well as the data before you can make a determination with regards to identifiability. So, but being really, really clear that identification is a function of not only data, but also context is crucial to a practical application of the Privacy Act and an understanding of when data is and is not going to be subject to it. So just to give a, a completely unrelated example, but it, it, it amused me. Um, just very recently, my daughter has um, set up an Instagram account. And she chose, uh, when she set up this Instagram account, uh, this image to be her um, picture. And um, I asked her why she chose this image. She chose this image because only her friends would recognize her. Anyone who knew her would have the context that would allow her to be identified through this image. And our surname's Taylor, it's a very common uh, name. It can be quite difficult to pull us out of any kind of social media feed because there's just so many of us. So her friends would be able to look at this and know it's her. But she chose it because people who didn't know, already know her wouldn't be able to identify her from it. And I just thought it was a really nice little example, work, worked example of how identifiability is dependent on not only data, but also context. The, a little bit more formally, the, if you look at the OAIC guidance, the example they give relates to a uh, license plate number on a car. And they talk about a rego the license plate number on the car being identifiable information in the hands of people 
that have access to the car registration database. But it not being identifiable if you have no means, no practical means by which you can link that license plate number to an individual. Now, of course, we recognize that license plates aren't only associated with individuals through access to the car registration database. You, you, you might know your family members, your friends' registration plates. You might recognize them when they drive past you on the freeway because you recognize their, their number plate and you uh, identify that with them. So there are lots of different contexts, some formal, some informal, which might enable identification, including self-identification. If you were to watch a news piece and you were to see your car uh, drive past, um, there are lots of different contexts, but you need a context. Without access to the car registration database or some other context which allows you to make that connection between the license plate and an individual, without that, possibility of connection, their individual is not identifiable. Okay, so then if you begin to apply that to the genomic data, within the paper, we go through some of the qualities of different types of genomic data, and we recognize that different types of genomic data, raw data or interpreted data or annotated data, vary according to volume, according to richness, according to uniqueness. And we recognize that if you look at some of the OAIC guidance, the uniqueness, the relative uniqueness of ge some genomic data at least, might lead you instinctively to assume that it is always going to be identifiable. And in fact, there's guidance from the regulator which would seem to support that kind of intuition. The guidance states um, some information is unique to a particular person and may in itself identify that person. But I have to say, I don't think this guidance from the regulator is particularly helpful in the way it makes that point. Because even the most unique information still needs that capacity to connect that context, which allows for connection between an individual and the data in question. And the significance of features, including uniqueness, has to be interpreted in context. And this is where other guidance I think comes in and is more useful where the regulator notes that where it's technically possible to identify an individual by referencing the data in question against other available information, entities should also consider the likelihood that this would occur. I've had many discussions with data scientists over the year about anonymization and identification. And uh, I accept as a matter of fact, that the absolute perfect anonymization of data, particularly at unit level, if it ever was a possibility, it's, it's now a, a thing of the past. Data flows through such fluid contexts. We now have such processing power. There's so many databases against which things might be linked that the possibilities of inferential identification, jigsaw identification, the possibilities of just re-identifying data that has been de-identified or anonymized. They're, they're real now in a way that they, they weren't real before. There's a, there's a technical possibility of identification now in many cases that wouldn't otherwise have existed. But the technical possibility, the, the fact that it's theoretically possible isn't enough to categorize something as personal information from a legal perspective. If an individual is not identified already, the question is whether or not they are reasonably identifiable. And you have to consider the likelihood that this is gonna occur, not just the technical possibility. So you have to look not only at the data, its richness, its volume and its uniqueness, but you must also consider the data environment or the data situation within which the data is held considering all these other material factors, some of which I've already referred to, factors such as who has access to it. Is this, is this an open data set, open to the world, or is it a restricted one? Um, are people able to come into this closed environment and see it, or can they come in and download it and take some, something away with them? What, what other information does the context make available to them? Um, what time would it take, what cost, what resource? All of these questions, 
are part of an assessment of the data environment and the data situation. And when data is in a controlled environment, not if it's released on the web and it's open to the world, but if it's in a controlled environment, then technical, organization, organizational and legal methods, such as contractual and in, in, um, contractual methods, uh, can affect that data situation and affect the material likelihood of an individual's identify, identification and the question of reasonable identifiability. That said, the evaluative process of assessing identifiability is going to be dynamic and ongoing. This isn't a kind of a set and forget thing, particularly as the data situation itself changes and any of these material factors, who has access, what other information is available, time, cost, resource, all, as those things change and they will change, then the assessment of identifiability itself is going to, risks of identifiability, likelihood of identifiability will change. The same information can be personal information in one situation and not personal information in another. If you take this exactly the same data and you put it in an open access environment, you might be putting it in an environment which means that data plus context results in a sufficiently high likelihood of identifiability that this data is properly categorized as personal information but you apply those technical, organizational, contractual controls to close the environment to mitigate that risk, it may not be personal information. So the same data can both be personal information and not, depending upon the context. And as I just said, information holdings themselves are dynamic. The character information can change over time, so determinations of identifiability themselves need to change with new developments and changing circumstances. Okay, so I, uh, I started by asking this question, look, if we, if we conceptually distinguish between genomic data from a scientific perspective and genetic information from a legal one, then what we really want to understand is whether or not these concepts are perfectly overlapping, are their boundaries coterminous or not? And the answer is not not necessarily. They're overlapping concepts, but the overlap is going to depend on this kind of evaluative conclusion that's reached in all the circumstances and uh, will, will need to take the kind of consideration I've described into account when determining that. Identifiability is going to depend on qualities of the data, such as its volume, its rich, richness and its uniqueness, but when placed in context. So it's the data situation as a whole, which needs to be assessed and not the data in isolation. Control over context is thus then key, and it will be dependent on these organization, organizational, technical and contractual controls that I've described, but it might also be dynamic. So the assessment of identifiability and the assessment of when and if genomic data is genetic information itself should consider the fluidity of the relevant interpretive context. Okay. I hope, uh, oh, why is this important? Well, it's important for understanding your rights and responsibilities under the Privacy Act, but also for critically evaluating the Privacy Act as it stands and whether or not we've got that overlap right now or not. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Thanks so much, Mark. That was a great presentation. It's definitely giving me a lot of food for thought. We do now have time for people to ask Mark questions. If you have a question, please type that into the Q&A box and we will get to those. I'm going to kick off with a question that we received a little earlier, and it's around what is the ruling on epigenetic sequencing data? For example, DNA methylation data where the actual genomic sequence is not analyzed. Uh, well, there, I think the question as to whether or not it's identifiable or not is going to, we're going to take the same kind of process, walk through the same kind of steps as I just, as I just outlined. One will one only be looking at the data, but one will be looking at the context within which the data is hot held and asking whether or not that data is about an identified or identifiable individual. 
So the question of identifiability, I think, is going to be answered in exactly the same way as I've described. Um, whether or not it's genetic information or not, uh, I'd need I'd need more understanding as to whether or not we feel that it's going to satisfy that legal definition of genetic information, either as health information or not. And I don't know enough about the science to answer that, but I'd be very happy to have a, a further conversation around it. I might interject with my own question here, and it's, do you think that in the future that other types of um, health related omics data might also be written into law, for example, methylation data or proteomics data, as well as genetic data? Um, I think that already, I mean, whether they're written in explicitly or not, they are they will still be captured if they fall within the uh, definition of health information. So whether or not they're explicitly written in or not will depend upon, I think, whether there are specific rights and responsibilities we want to attach to them, which are different from the rights and responsibilities which we would otherwise see attached to them. So um, I'm, I'm not actually, personally, I'm not a great, fan of ever expanding lists of data types because i just think it, it becomes more confusing I, I i prefer a relatively um high level principles which can be applied which can be understood and applied without constantly getting to definitional dispute um so i don't know whether we will or not i haven't actually heard any suggestion that we will i haven't personally heard any calls for it but i think whether or not there is a need for it will depend upon whether or not people feel that data of that type is currently being well served by its categorization or not as health information more generally so others are better placed to answer that really than me melissa but uh, yeah. i'd be interested to know what if, if people think there's a good reason for, for calling them out specifically what that reason would be I guess we'll watch your space for the answer to that one. There are a couple of questions that are coming in around the same topic, and it seems to be about how, as a researcher, do you figure out what is reasonable? How, how do you assess that context and whether it's possible or reasonable that somebody might use that in a way that you didn't intend? I'm paraphrasing a little here because the questions are quite uh, uh, detailed in the Q&A panel. Um, well, for, first of all, I think you recognise the significance of context itself to a determination of the question. So one moves away from thinking that looking at the data alone is going to answer the question for you. You understand, you, you appreciate the significance of, of the context within which the data is being held. And that is both a the organizational, the, the, the contractual and the technical, as I've described it. So is this open data, is it not? Um, but once you've thought about the context and the controls and the likelihood of this data being associated with an individual, given all of those contextual factors, you're probably better placed to make that judgment call than anyone else, because you have an understanding of the data that that's exceeds anyone else's. So I think one of the things to encourage people to do is just to reflect upon this question and then to perhaps if they're concerned, um, make sure, at least document the position they've reached following reflection so that they, 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 if ever challenged, they can explain why they came to the conclusion this was or was not. And also, don't be shy to reach out within organizations for help um, because organizations like universities have people within them that should be there to help work through these questions from a legal perspective. You're not, you shouldn't be expected to be lawyers, um, but the organization should make that kind of advice available to you if you need it. Great, thanks for that good advice. And but, but, Sorry, just on that, but also don't don't think that you can go to a lawyer and they're going to be able to provide a clear answer to you without your insight, because your understanding of the data and the context is going to be crucial to that uh, that evaluative 
determination that I was describing. Sorry, Melissa. No, that's fine. That's good advice. I was just going to jump to a related question. Do you have particular resources that you can point people towards that can help them um, ensure that connected clinical or demographic data doesn't make an individual identifiable? Are there any guidelines on that? Well, the, the OAIC have issued guide, Office of the Australian Information Commissioner have issued um, guide, general guidance. There is a de-identification framework, which you can download from their website, which, which talks you through the kinds of things I've been talking about today at, 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 a, at a more technical level, but still at, not specific to genomics. Um, there is the work of um, Australian um, genomics, uh, I know that Australian Genomics on their website have various resources and tools made available to, to researchers. Um, but beyond those, um, don't immediately, no additional resources immediately come to mind. But I would hope that those two combined would provide some assistance. And, and if not, then... Um, work with organizations such as Australian Biocommons and uh, Australian Genomics and, and others to, to generate these kinds of um, pieces of guidance and good practice and codes of conduct oneself. Um, certainly within, um, I, I think there is, there is a, a lot of um, value in coming together and, and reaching a, a, a common view about whether or not in specific circumstances, having taken into account all the evaluative considerations that the guidance and the case law suggest need to be brought into consideration. You know, can we collectively form a view here? Uh, and if so, that may itself be quite um, compelling when it comes to any other um, interpretation and application of the law. Just, there's often there is often not a simple answer people often think that the law should be able to just say yes or no and unfortunately the answer is invariably it depends but what a, a lawyer can help you do is work out what it depends on and then you then with your own subject specific expertise have to then step through that and and reach a judgment which um is defensible in the light of the guidance and, and the legal advice you've received Thanks for that. Changing track slightly here, and the next question is wondering how informed consent impacts on this topic and has the talk been focusing on circumstances where an individual hasn't given informed consent for their information to be used for various future purposes? The talk has been focused on an understanding of when genomic data will be will fall within scope of the Privacy Act. So in order to be subject to the Privacy Act, it has to be personal information. If it's subject to the Privacy Act, then the organisation that's using it has to meet all sorts of responsibilities, including either having consent or having a, 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 an, an appropriate lawful alternative to it. So for example, if it's research use, then there might be a scope for a waiver of consent in the circumstances. But those responsibilities to get consent or the limited avenues to, to proceed without consent, they apply when ge genomic data is genetic information and is subject to the Privacy Act. So this talk hasn't been about whether or not um, hasn't been about informed consent at all, or it's everything about it. Everything about the talk has been about informed consent because the talk is about does the Privacy Act apply? And the responsibilities with regards to informed consent only kick in if it's subject to um, statutory and um, privacy protection. Another question for me now is, are there additional laws that relate to how uh, use and misuse of data as well as whether it is private information or not? Um, I thought, well, there's lots of laws um, uh, and there's uh, at state and territory level as well as federal level. 
Um, uh, ma many of them relate specifically to health information or, or um, they relate to personal information and there is a, a additional responsibilities in relation to health information. Um, often they do, their scope does turn on whether or not they relate to an individual who is identifiable or not. Uh, some state and territory law actually makes it a requirement that the data be um, contribute towards an individual or be capable of contributing towards the ascertainment of an individual's identity. So, um, so there are certainly lots of other privacy and data protection laws beyond the Privacy Act. Many of them also make identifiability key to um, can the right, the establishment of rights and responsibilities. If one is thinking about other laws aside from those relating to privacy and data protection, um, then yeah, yeah, there most definitely are other laws, but their applicability to genomic data is going to depend upon the circumstances and whether or not where they're held. So, for example, My Health Record Act has got particular controls if data's in My Health Record. You've, you've, we have a new Data Availability and Transparency um, Act, which is going to relate to data which is held within um, government um, repositories. So you've got, there are lots of other rules, but uh, one of the reasons that I think this question which we've been considering today is significant and interesting is that many of the laws actually only apply to data when it is identifiable and there are far fewer controls in relation to data when it is not about an identified or identifiable individual and that is a, a truism which applies to many of the different laws that we might be considering to what makes it such a pivotal concept it's starting to become slightly clearer to me I'm sure it gets more and more complicated the more you look at it. Um, a couple more questions coming in, um, and I'm going to paraphrase a little because there's a couple of similar questions. They seem to be about um, the fact that the area of genetic data and genomics is quite dynamic and is changing all the time. So how do we go about future-proofing the decisions we're making now for changes in technology that might make data identifiable in the future can we even do that should we even do that well one so one way of approaching this that i have talked to people about in the past it's not always appropriate but sometimes it's useful to recognize that if you categorize something as personal information, it doesn't mean that you can't use it. It's not like personal information is this kind of toxic thing that we want to avoid at all costs. Personal information can be used for clinical and research uses, and in fact is used all the time for clinical and research and public health purposes. It just there are certain governance requirements which attach to personal information that don't attach to non-personal information. So if you think that this data might be personal or might become personal, then the first question is, well, can you actually just treat it as such from the outset? Because if you can, then this question of whether or not it technical changes in the future might impact upon the likelihood of identifiability rather falls away because you've been treating it as personal information throughout. So I recognize that that's not always going to be possible. Um, and where it's not possible, there might just have to be a recognition of the, the certain constraints that that might place upon the changes to the environment that you can permit moving forward because of the risks that that might posed to identifiability, so the partners that you can partner with, for example. But one of the things to consider, I think, from the outset is, well, actually, what if we set this up? What if we set this up so that we were we knew from the outset that this was personal information, we handled it as such, we did everything we needed to do in order to appropriately handle it as personal information? Then, then some of these questions about 
the judgment calls. You know, is it identifiable or is it not? Just let's treat it as if it is, and or as if it could be. And no, it's not always going to be possible, and I accept that. But sometimes it is, so it should at least be a, a consideration. Well, thanks a lot, Mark. This has certainly given people a lot to think about and has triggered a lot of questions. We are, however, going to have to leave it there for today. So thank you very much for coming along and sharing your thoughts and expertise with us. Just as we wrap up, I have a couple more things to tell people about, if you just bear with me a moment. So as I said at the beginning, this webinar is part of a series of webinars that we run, and we also run workshops on various topics. You can find out more about what's coming up in the BioCommons by having a look at our website, and you can catch up on recordings of past events on the Australian BioCommons newsletter, uh, Australian BioCommons YouTube channel. You can also keep in touch with us via Twitter or by subscribing to our newsletter. Finally, finally, I'd like to acknowledge that Australian BioCommons is enabled by NCRIS funding via BioPlatforms Australia. So once again, thank you so much to Mark for sharing your time with us today. And thank you to everybody for joining us as well. I hope that you've enjoyed the webinar and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Until then, goodbye for now and enjoy the rest of your day.